So welcome back to Demo Disc Theater for issue number 65 of the official U.S. PlayStation Magazine. The last episode, we went through the playground with all the demos, but there's so much content on these PS2 demo discs that I always have to split these up. So the second episode, we're going to look at all of the other things. These episodes tend to be a little bit shorter. We have the getaway here. There was a demo of this in the playground, and I played through it. It was an impressive game, technologically and graphically, in its era. But I feel like its gameplay just wasn't quite as refined as I would like it to be. Like, if you could have the shooting mechanics be a little bit better. The driving mechanics were alright, I guess. But uh, the shooting mechanics really needed some work. And it sort of seems to be built around like the like the visual appeal of like the Guy Ritchie movies. That little goofy little British sense of humor and the dirty grittiness. I guess we're in London. I mean the game was a moderately big deal in its era. I didn't buy it. Played the demo didn't buy it just didn't speak to me as much because it it didn't give me the kind of um, the gameplay loop that I liked out of the didn't give me the gameplay loop that I liked out of the Grand Theft Auto series where you're more or less just a terror machine just having fun causing all sorts of mayhem this is a little goofy because we have Multiple features for this. Let's just watch this one. Oh, for referencing Guy Ritchie. And um, there's two protagonists. So there's Mark Hammond, who's an ex-gangster, and uh, Frank Carter, who's um, a copper. And uh, the story begins um, as Mark wakes up in his apartment. And uh, he hears screams coming from downstairs, and it's his wife. And he runs out, and his wife's been murdered in the street. Has no idea why, and his son's just been bundled into a car that's screeching around the corner. Go, 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 go! Then the backstory comes, and you realise that Mark's actually been in London's crime underworld, uh, and now he's being dragged back into that lifestyle by Charlie Jolson. You're in no position to be making demands. What's this all about, Charlie? I thought you'd retired. You know what I have. Sure. Make the boy listen. Well, one of the things we tried to do with this game is to make the story stand up, and, you know, compared to a film, and, and that's difficult because it, in traditionally in games the story <laughs> tends to get in the way of the gameplay. So we make the gameplay work first, and then have the narrative wrap around that. So that's a bit of a different way to go about writing the story. You think that playing as Mark Hammond, say. Uh, this guy's going to be a little bit of a dodgy geezer, perhaps not very moralistic. In fact, Mark Hammond plays the game for very moral reasons to get his son back. Then you go to the other side of the law, and uh, Frank Carter, who you assume is going to be the good guy figure, is a little bit dodgy in his ways because even though he's playing as the right side of the law, he'll do anything to get his guy, if you like. Charlie Jolson, he would be your arch nemesis. Mark has had links with Charlie in the past. Well, I took a minute and looked it up. Really uh, Team Soho was a British game development studio that Sony picked up Yasmin and eventually and merged them into London Studio, studio but they started out with the NBA Charlie shootout games, which was a little bit strange. But when they created, merged into London Studio, you saw a lot of games like the iToy games, the SingStar games, another The Getaway, uh, the Getaway sequel. But interestingly, when I roll down towards the end of their um, game releases, you see PlayStation Home, the little MMO thing for the PS3. Um, Wonder Book, which is that goofy little iToy or PlayStation 3 iToy game. Um, Blood and Truth and PlayStation VR Worlds, 
which make total sense considering the sort of like British gangster setting of those games. And there was another game called Erica that released that I never heard of. Interactive film? I don't know what that is. Um, PS4 game. But the studio was closed. Part of a major layoff across Sony in 2024. The current year. Actually closed in May, which was only a few months ago. That's a little bit of a disappointing thing to think about. A studio that existed for 20-some years didn't have a lot of like really important releases to them. But, you know, it's always sad when you, like, people must have gotten laid off. And, like, Blood and Truth was apparently a very good game. And um, VR Worlds, I thought that was a great tech demo for VR. But maybe none of those really performed on the market. I like these things that they had coming out on these demo discs that go into the development side of things. Because you're seeing, for a lot of times, people... Have video games to most consumers are little magic boxes where a disc goes in and fun comes out. And you don't really get much in the way of a perspective on how anything is done behind the scenes. So seeing this kind of stuff is really fascinating, especially if you don't know anything about game development. But seeing this motion capture stuff, especially in an era where motion capture was much less popular or refined, where they have like the, these motion capture things where they're capturing the doing the motion capture performance. And the actors are doing like the voice lines and all that at the same time. It's something you see more now than you would back then. And um, I see they don't have motion capture on the face during these animations like you would nowadays. But you know, early 2000s. It seems like they might be doing the voiceover at the same time as the motion capture. That's that's interesting. So there looks like they're making plaster molds of everybody's face, and then they're scanning those molds into the computer in order to model the character. Which does kind of look like what they did in the game, where they have these sort of relatively deep, well detailed faces for the time and generation that are stiff and static. There wouldn't have been a lot of bones that they could make at the time. In character models, um, so like there's only so much they could do. Kind of like, I don't like it. And after about 15 minutes, I yeah, this must be an unpleasant thing. I've never gone through this, but this must suck. Move, move your face inside the, the, the mask. Um, I started to move my face, and the silly thing I tried to do, I opened my eyes. But you can't open your eyes, and then I realized. So <laughs> weird. And I panicked, and it got to. I just wanted to tear it off. Then the next process is they fill that full of plaster of Paris, and they get a model of you that looks like you do now. I have a shame though. This studio looked like it's like a AAA studio. That a lot of time, money, and technology must have gone into the getaway. And then they take this studio and then relegate them to making iToy games. Uh, that's a bit of a disappointment, you know? But then again, I did have my own series of criticisms towards the getaway, so... It doesn't matter how ambitious your game is, if it fails to live up to the hype or to sales, then... then it's just sort of... a waste. Something else I did see that was interesting, though, was that one of the, de the lead developers of The Getaway left to go form the company Team Bondi, who ended up working with Rockstar to develop the game... Oh, uh, shit, what's the game called? Oh, it's a, it's a private detective game. Or a, not a private detective game, you're a cop. During the post World War II era, shit. What's that movie called? What's that game called? Oh, damn it! This is bothering me. L.A. Noir. 
came to me all of a sudden. And it was another ambitious game. One that, I guess, feels like something of an extension of the getaway in a lot of ways. Sort of like a... I, I guess at the time I considered L.A. Noir to be an offshoot of the Grand Theft Auto games because it... You saw the similarities, but I guess, really, it's sort of an offshoot of the getaway. That's that's an interesting thought. L.A. Noir, though, was a bit of a frustrating game. It's very ambitious. Something that was probably way too expensive to develop, and unless it pulled in GTA numbers, it wasn't going to turn a profit. Or not a significant profit, which is unfortunate because it, like, it did have a lot going, going for it, but it... I had some frustrations with it where like it had this large open world recreation of Los Angeles in 1940s. Now I'd never been to Los Angeles in the 1940s so I can't say how accurate it was, but it certainly felt like a, a real modeling of the environment. But it had a very mission based structure where it would move from chapter to chapter and didn't give you any feeling that you needed to explore the world. It would direct you on a map to where your mission started. It would start off, you'd have like a briefing, and then you'd drive to the crime scene. And you'd drive to different witnesses and then back to the police station in order to interrogate. But there was this large cityscape around you that you felt no need or desire or motivation to go and explore. It's like this whole city is modeled, but I'm not looking at it. I'm not exploring it like I would in a Grand Theft Auto game. And I guess the getaway might have had that same problem. There's this big city around you, but you're probably only ever going to the specific places that it tells you to. And this is as opposed to Grand Theft Auto 3, which just, or, or 4, or Vice City, or whatever, which plops you in the city, and then you can go to different places and start missions, but it more or less just lets you wander around on your own. So specifically in the earlier 3D GTA games, like 3 and Vice City, and uh, San Andreas, where the environments were smaller, maybe not so much San Andreas, the environment's rather large in that. But the city was small enough that I could more or less get an idea of where I was just by looking at the screen. And like, I could take a left here and a right there and then head down this road. And at the end is where you find the bus station or something like that. You, you get to learn that kind of stuff. Whereas in L.A. Noir, I never had any freaking clue where I was. And in games like um, GTA 4, I guess a little bit, but... I didn't drive a lot in that. I took a lot of taxis just to get to places quicker. And GTA 5, the map is larger. So you can, like, you learn your way around the map a little bit, but I didn't play it quite enough to memorize that in the same way. But I feel like the getaway was probably had the same problem that, that the L.A. Noir game had. Where big world... Lots of detail, lots of environment, but you're not exploring it because the game doesn't present you with a situation where it makes sense to try. Gunning down cops, yes. Great idea. You're not supposed to be a criminal, are you? <laughs> Grand Theft Auto, it makes sense to be gunning down cops because you are a criminal. But this guy seems like he's just trying to get his his son back. Killed his wife, took his son. But the cops didn't do that. The mobsters did. Team Bondi, the, the developer of L.A. Noir, closed down after that game released. I guess Rockstar didn't want to... I mean, when you have a publisher-developer relationship like that, the game has to turn a profit before you start seeing income coming into the developer. So if the game underperformed, they probably didn't see much money coming in. 
and they probably like, ah, we can't stay open and close down. It would have been nice to see another L.A. Noir game, one where they could have taken the idea and refined it to, like, ease out some of the complaints that I have. But it uh, wasn't meant to be, I guess. There was an L.A. Noir VR game, though, wasn't there? Was that a port of the original game, or was that, like, a special like episode that they developed for it. I don't know. I'm not gonna find out. I had a PlayStation VR. Had it for a little while and then gave it to my niece and nephew because they wanted it more than me. And then I bought an Oculus Rift S, which I haven't used in quite a while because VR feels like a little bit of a fad, passing fad to me. Plus, I'm really pissed off about the fact that um, the Oculus company or Facebook or whatever we want to call them more or less abandoned the Rift S in favor of the Quest series. <laughs> Which, like, I don't care how powerful of a smartphone chip you put in this fucking thing. My PC is vastly more powerful. And you really should be led encouraging more development on that hardware. I think I played a demo for this in another episode of this series this where you have, it's sort of like a uh, like a battle arena kind of thing where you're playing as these kaiju things and you're wrecking the buildings. Not quite like Rampage, but feels like Rampage-y kind of thing. I didn't like it. <laughs> but I don't have to like everything, do I? But it's a demonstration of the kind of experiments and smaller game types that you could see in this era of games. It happened in the PlayStation 1, where there was this big explosion of experimentation in games, because the game development had not yet exploded in terms of cost and distribution of games. The cost of that plummeted due to the optical media on the PlayStation 1. PlayStation 2 comes around and the cost of development obviously increases because more detail means more development time. But um, distribution was still cheap and it wasn't so expensive to develop games that you still had a lot of these little creative releases. So you saw weird little games like this that... Like, the developers of this were probably thinking if we sell 100,000 units, then we'll break even and we'll be happy. I don't know if it would have sold that many, but... When you get into, like, the PlayStation 3, 360 era, I don't know, with digital distribution, with Xbox Live, and with the PlayStation Network, the cost of distribution came down even more, but the cost of development went up a lot more than that. <laughs> and you could have smaller games like Flow or whatever that were niche titles that didn't necessarily have... or Journey. Journey is a great example. Where it was probably not enormous in terms of development cost, but Sony itself doesn't seem to be that interested in smaller releases anymore. They want everything to be these big, grand, epic games like The Last of Us Part 2, God of War Ragnarok, Spider-Man, these big expensive AAA experiences instead of these smaller, more niche things that wouldn't cost a lot to develop. Because Sony wants those big tentpole titles. And even if you think they have enough development studios to put some of them on these smaller titles, they tend not to do that. So, I don't know, it feels like Sony has sort of lost its way, and they are producing these tentpole games, like the last God of War, last couple of God of Wars, big, influential, well-beloved games. Last of Us 2 had a more of a mixed reaction, but it definitely sold a lot. Spider-Man 2, holy shit, that sold like crazy. 
Ten pole titles, I'm sure it's working out for Sony, but it does feel like we lost something without these little titles. I'm, I'm assuming this was a Sony-developed game. I don't remember, but probably. <laughs> or at least like a second-party game, like Sony didn't own the studio that developed it, but they funded the, uh, funded the development. Sort of like they uh, funded Helldivers. Helldivers and Helldivers 2. They don't own the studio that made it, but they're the publishers. So they funded development of it, and they're pulling in probably most of the profits from it. When we started off designing War of the Monsters, we wanted to make the game very pick up and play, very mass market. But so you get stuff like this that I'm not necessarily going to like, but I'm sure there's an audience for it. And if that audience wants to play something like this, hey, it's there for them. Simple light attack button, heavy attack button, And it probably took like a year to develop. And opposed to like a modern AAA game, which will take a bare minimum, like a bare rushed minimum of two years, more like three, four, five, six, seven. God damn, the next Dragon Age game has been in development for a decade, ten freaking years, and it's not an exaggeration, ten years. So it's like the, the development times for these AAA games is out of control. And that seems to be what these big studios want to just push a lot. I, I guess maybe I'm overgeneralizing a little bit too much because... I mean, I just mentioned Helldivers 2. Definitely not a AAA game and definitely an enormous success for Sony. But... It does definitely feel like they're pushing too hard into the AAA space, and the AAA space is just too expensive nowadays. Too long of a time to market. I'm not even talking about this game, but talking about other things, so maybe I should get on topic, but this video is going on for way too long. I like some of the designs of these things, like the praying mantis. I hate praying mantises as like a species of insect, but the design of this enemy looks cool, and the eye with electricity around it looks looks cool. And cool. Okay. Red Faction 2. Red Faction. One of the... Um, it didn't... It kind of broke the mold in a little way because it wasn't like a GoldenEye or Doom or anything like that. It was a, kind of its own thing in terms of first-person shooters. I guess maybe it took off after Half-Life a little bit more. But it had a gimmick to it that it had its own story about like oppression and Red class faction. warfare and all that kind of stuff. But the big deal about Red Faction was its environmental destruction mechanic. And its bare bones are simplistic by modern day standards. But it it served as more than a gimmick in that parts of the game like really were vital that you had to like blow holes in the wall or it opened up new opportunities for level progression or strategies to moving around but you would throw like a grenade or fire off a rocket launcher and if it hit a wall it would blow a hole in the wall and i always wondered how they did it and i came at the conclusion is probably sort of like they um form like a an uh, like a spherical object or something in the environment that just got hit by the rocket and then it would perform like a tessellation algorithm on the meshes that it interact that it intersected with creating a hole Literally blowing away the static environment concept. and red faction 2 i guess like enhance that feature like you're looking at it right now and you could destroy the game world and it was and it wasn't just like in very specialized cases like any almost anywhere if you fired off a rocket and it hit a wall it would blow a hole in it and i think it reflects I'd say you don't see that kind of destruction that often in games, even now, because they don't tend to focus on that kind of thing. 
You'll see like Battlefield Bad Company or something. This is, a, this is an old game, of course. But Battlefield Bad Company where you could destroy a building. You blow out the supports for a building and it'll collapse. But it doesn't have the kind of destruction where you're blowing holes in the environment like this. And I guess it's because developers don't want to have the headache of trying to perform something like this in modern day graphics. I'd say the closest thing to this would probably be something like No Man's Sky, where you could point your laser miner gun onto the ground and just start drilling a hole into the environment. But No Man's Sky is very specifically developed around that feature, so it's not just a little, like, an aspect of it. So, Red Faction actually playing the game nowadays, though, is a little bit frustrating because it doesn't control the way a modern first-person shooter would. Is that Lance Hendrickson? <laughs> I wasn't paying attention. That, that looks like Lance Hendrickson. THQ brought in Hollywood veteran Lance Henriksen. Yeah, it's Lance Henriksen. God, he looked ancient 25 freaking years ago. Still alive, too. That's amazing. <laughs> I don't remember his voice in this game. I figured that's something I'd remember. Oh, you know what? This is Red Faction 2. I didn't play that one as much. Red Faction 1 was the game that I played a lot of. Um, I know they had a Red Faction game for like the PS360, and I think the series died off after that. Which is a bit of a shame. I think it had its own um, appeal. Especially if they were going to continue with like the significant environmental destruction thing that other companies weren't really doing anymore. It looks like there was a remaster of Red Faction Guerrilla, which was the PS360 game. And it came out for the PS4, Xbox One, and Windows, and eventually the Switch. I never played Guerrilla. Oh, you know what? I might have played a demo of Guerrilla. I'm not sure. But it, it, you know, I guess it didn't feel so special anymore. Like, a big part of the appeal was the environmental destruction thing. And although modern games don't do it as much or in the same way, it's not as special because the earlier Red Faction games already tread over those waters. I'm arguing against myself here. That's really stupid. Anyway, Red Faction was a good first-person shooter series, particularly in, like, the PlayStation 2 era, where they didn't have Halo, and they didn't... But they got Call of Duty later on, but it wasn't, like, the major Call of Duty games. All right. I think that's the only two things in this section. Replay. Jumping. Replays are just little... My name Tricks. is Mike Hurahan, and today I'll be showing you a cool move in Evolution Skateboarding where you can get 99 trick combos Bring game testers. if you do it right. It must suck to be a so game tester. Because it sounded like something that would be like really awesome, and I hear it's a way that a lot of developers got into the industry at the time, which is like you just get into the office and then you learn as you go. Probably not the case anymore, where everything is probably much more like based on education or being able to prove yourself and making mods or shit like that. But you think that game testing would be great because you're you're playing video games. It seems like, oh, well, I'd love to get paid to play video games. But the fact is that it probably just sucked because you're going to be playing the same game over and over and over again because you're looking for bugs, not trying to enjoy it. And you may, you may play a game to play test it for the sake of seeing if it's fun, but you're going to be playing it over and over and over again. And you're going to have to be filing reports about it. And then have to go back and play it again. And the new build comes out and you got to go and play that same part over and over again, looking for bugs, seeing if it controls a little bit better, all that kind of stuff. Seems like it would just sap the fun 
out of playing games. And if my job was to play games, and I like had it as a hobby, when I went home, I'd not want to sit down in front of the TV and play Devil May Cry or whatever. Tons of skills. In fact, so this even this, this YouTube channel, move. to some extent, the saps game, the so fun out of games. Which is one of the reasons why I tend to fall off of um, producing new content for it. Is that oh, it sort of interferes Mitchell, with my ability to cool enjoy it as a hobby at times. Complete, so, yeah, like, so oh, like, oh, geez. Like, do I want to play games to produce an episode or do I want to play a game for the sake of just relaxing or having fun and if I get into the habit of playing it for the sake of relaxing and having fun instead of trying to produce some sort of content then an episode for anything is not going to be made for a long time plus I have a rather significant or um, impairing um, case of ADHD, which kind of fucks with my ability to produce. <laughs> I can really fall into a slump of not being productive. And in the event that I find something that I'm really interested in, I can like lock myself into it and it just absorbs me and keeps me going for a long period of time. It's so... Um, but... Right now, I'm in the if it's something that, like, even a little bit feels tax, like work, I can just get, get, uh, with the violator gear. You get the violator just have a real hard time staying on it. If this were some kind of an actual job for me, like if it were generating revenue, then I'm sure it wouldn't be a problem because I, in general, I don't have a problem actually doing a job because I'm forced to do it and that sort of like works with my brain in a beneficial way. Like you give me a deadline to do something, I'm gonna fucking do it because my brain will latch on to it and my specific um, neuroatypical brain will actually work to my advantage and allow me to focus on that and really just overachieve in a lot of ways. But in the case where something is more or less just a hobby, which is what this is channel is, I can have a real hard time staying fixed on it. Nice hat. I wonder what happened to these people. It's like I said, a lot of the, a lot of people getting into game testing used it as a sort of foot in the door with companies at the time, at least, to become proper developers. And I wonder if that happened with some of these people. The face off is a basic rock paper scissors game. I wasn't paying attention. What game did we just jump into? <laughs> So I'm at a face oh, okay, an NHL game. Tips off that he's going to do a pass, so I do a poke check. I have not been paying attention off. to any of these. I am. That's, that's the ADHD the acting up. <laughs> Talking about some other check. shit. So look for that as well. Hockey, I the like. Paper, scissors game I've gone to a few hockey games, but I'm not a hockey fan. Beats poke check and pass beats the only check. hockey games the that I ever played was Wayne Gretzky's 3D hockey on the N64, and. There was a hockey demo for the first demo disc I had for the PlayStation for the PlayStation 1 that I played over and over again because I played everything uh, over and over again on that demo. Oh, Stuntman. This is a um, this is a memory card uh, save. Why am I doing this? So there's no demo here. There's no video, which is unfortunate. Stuntman was a game, I think, made by the developers Reflections, which did the Driver series, which is another series that just fell off the map, unfortunately. Uh, there was a bad release and then no one cared anymore. Stuntman was kind of... It felt like a way for Reflections to dip their toes into the water of the PlayStation 2, get to learn how to develop a game on the PS2 without throwing all of their resources into a larger title like a driver game would be. Where you play as a stuntman and you drive a car through a series of, of obstacles and you're 
graded on your skills or maybe you just have to complete all the stunts in a certain amount of time or something like that. Brutally difficult game though. I found it fun up until I ran into the point where I discovered that the game had almost no forgiveness in terms of you making a mistake. If you screwed up, it would... You you just wouldn't be able to, to get moving again, like if you smacked into a telephone pole or something like that. Or you jumped off of a ramp wrong, it would slow you down enough that you just couldn't make your time limit. And it was frustrating. Oh, it's just, just another... It's just another... Uh, thing. Aggressive inline. Another game following in the like, likes of Tony Hawk. I don't remember it being a bad game. I remember actually enjoying it. Although I'm pretty sure I only played the demo. Didn't have, didn't own or rent the game. Uh, Evolution Skateboard, obviously another skateboard game by Tony Hawk. But, uh, oh wait, we already watched this one. <laughs> I don't know if I ever played it though. It's not one I remember. Extras! On tour. Sony was always on tour with this kind of shit where they'd they would load up a semi-trailer with um, PlayStation 2s and TVs, like demo kiosk units, and they'd go to these places for the sake of publicity. Showing off their new games. Oh man, the old PlayStation.com website. Uh, what's it look like now? Doesn't look anything like this. Bagel Bites Extreme? What? Just a... Just a... What, what are the details to this? Big screen TV and PlayStation 2 or a snowboard lesson? I don't snowboard, so I would have taken the PS2 and the TV. Although I don't have anywhere... Didn't have when I was a kid. I didn't have any rooms large enough to have a, what they called a big screen TV at the time, which would have been a projection TV. Wouldn't have had anywhere to put it. Extreme Sports Stars. So much popularity in extreme sports or like the X Games kinds of things at the time. Although I failed to see how these were extreme in comparison to a lot of other sports, like football or boxing. <laughs> I mean, they were certainly more niche. There's a lot of popularity, like exploding popularity of like X Games and stuff like that. And I'm sure the Tony Hawk game had no small part in doing that. Oh, there's Tony Hawk. Yet yeah, it's just the popularity of this concept of a game dropped off significantly in the PlayStation 3 360 era. I mean, it was just, it was so much saturation in the market. There were so many Tony Hawk games. There's so many, like, aggressive inlines and all these other kinds of things that I guess people got tired of it. And perhaps the popularity of extreme sports sort of waned as well. Definitely fueled by, like, uh, Gen X and Millennial. Uh, millennials, which I guess um, Gen Z doesn't really have as much of an interest in this kind of thing. Yeah, Aggressive Inline did seem like it was a good game. I should try to find the demo of that and uh, play it for this series. Remember I had friends that were really into, like, skateboarding and would talk to me, like, about their, uh, they'd show me these videos of skateboarders and all this kind of stuff, and I'd look at it, and it's like, yeah, that's, that's impressive, like, he, like, did a kickflip into a grind or something like that, and I can recognize it as being, like, an impressive feat athletically, but I just didn't have the interest <laughs> to know who any of these people were. Like, I remember there was this, there was this, I only remember, like, a couple of names, like, Tony Hawk, obviously, because that's the name everybody remembers. 
But like there was this guy named Just in Case, so his first name was Justin, his last name was Case. I don't know a damn thing about this guy other than his name. Because <laughs> that's such an unusual name. Reminds me of this guy I knew in high school named Chris Pease. Christopher Pease. Crispies. <laughs> Crispies! <laughs> oh, I'm fucking making fun of a guy that I actually knew on, on the internet. That's, that's fucked up. I'm a terrible human being. I really am. <laughs> I've wandered off topic again. What am I talking about? I'm talking about Chris Pease when I'm supposed to be talking about Just In Case. Just In Case. That's awesome. I wish I had a name like that. <laughs> oh fuck, I made up my own name. I made up my own name for the sake of this this YouTube channel. And I didn't choose something like just in case. I, oh man. Should have I should have done something. I should have gone and made it some kind of a pun. <laughs> MLG, uh Mega Lazy Gamer. I uh I didn't realize at the time there were two things that I didn't realize when I made that name up. One, that there was another YouTube uh, personality who had started a little bit before me and became way more popular called um, Lazy Game Reviews. And the word lazy and the word game in there kind of makes it feel like I'm ripping them off, although that wasn't the case. It's different enough, but whatever. But also MLG is um, an initialism for Major League Gaming. Which is something that I didn't know at the time. I didn't realize that until like five or six years after I started this channel. I, I had a guy working for me um, who was a professional gamer. Uh, he, he, he didn't work for me as a professional gamer. It's something he did on the side. Uh, he was one of my employees in my real life job. And he would occasionally talk about like he would do Call of Duty or, or something like that. And then one day he just referred to it as like, yeah, like, it's for my MLG stuff. And I'm like, you're what? <laughs> and it didn't occur to me that that's what he was talking about. A lot of people involved in this. It didn't, it didn't occur to me until that moment that MLG was an initialism for Major League Gaming. And I had heard the term Major League Gaming before, just it didn't click to me. So... I did not intend for either the association with Major League Gaming or the um, or to rip off Lazy Game Reviews. That just wasn't wasn't my intention. Just for the way it worked out. Fuck, 42 and a half minutes to get through all the extra features on this. So much content on these discs. This was an awesome time to be alive as a gamer because there was so much going on. And these demo discs were so stuffed full of content, it was... Oh, the nostalgia just creeps its way in. Anyway, that's the end of this one.